Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Potter's House Christian Fellowship in Joondala. We're just about to begin. We'd like our text in Judges chapter 16. We'll read verse number 1 to 5. Thank you. Just as we're turning there, you may be aware of Spider-Man and the X-Men and the Avengers and they were written by a fellow called Stan Lee who was very popular and though I didn't particularly like Stan Lee's stuff too much as a kid reading comics, there's certainly no doubting the 15 or 20 million Australian dollars that he's got just for the Avengers series alone, which is a lot of money. So Stan Lee was interviewed and in the interview he spoke about the success that his stories had or his superheroes. And I thought it was an interesting statement that he made in that interview. He says that, that if there was a formula, he says it was based on the idea that we might have somebody who might be able to walk on walls, might be a Spider-Man, might be coloured green, might, be a, might have the supernatural strength or power or to do one thing or another. But he says that's a given and people can accept that. But he says the second thing, or the second element, that which was equally important, if not more important, was would he still have to worry about things in life that everybody else had to worry about? Did he have to worry about dandruff? Did he have acne? Did he have to worry about getting jilted by his girlfriend? All these other things were things that each one of us has to deal with. Stan Lee has put these on his characters that he made, and he says that this was the the key component of the success, that he might, they might have been superheroes, but they also had big problems the same as everybody else. Now, this characters that, or these characters that Stan Lee commented about, they remind me a lot of Samson. And so those Stan Lee characters were mythical. Samson was a, was a genuine human being, a real person who lived, that had supernatural strength from the Holy Ghost, but he had some real issues in life. Let's read about this man. Judges chapter 16, verses 1 through 5. The Bible says, Now Samson went to Gaza, and he saw a harlot there, and he went into her. When the Gazites were told, Samson has come here, they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the gate of the city. They were quiet all night, saying, In the morning, when it is daylight, we will kill him. And Samson lay low till midnight. Then he arose at midnight, took hold of the doors of the gates of the city, and the two gateposts pulled them up, bar and all, put them on his shoulders and carried them up to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. Afterward it happened that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, Entice him and find out where his great strength lies and by what means we may overpower him, that we may bind him to afflict him, and every one of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. Let's think about this story, a very sad story, but one that does have a happy ending, if we can think of that. I'd like to think about this macho man and his mean mum. As some commentators, like Warren Wearsby, says he's a he-man, but he had a shit weakness. That was his problem. This fellow was the last of the major judges. As you're reading through the book of Judges in the Old Testament, we'll, we read about a number of people like Gideon and some of these other stellar heroes, but there was nobody quite like Samson who has ever lived before or since this man. And the Bible tells us that he killed 30 Philistines at one time because of a bet that he had made and he wanted to fulfill that. This was at his first wedding. Then the Bible tells us he took the tails of 300 foxes, he tied them together, he lit torches to them and set them amongst the standing grain of the Philistines. Now he must not have only just had super strength. I don't know how otherwise he could grab these foxes without also having super speed. But I, whatever the issue was, this is what the Bible tells us happens. But the account that we read says that the Philistines tried to pay him back for this and they set fire to his wife and also father. And because of this, Samson attacked many of them, the Bible says in Judges chapter 15 verse 7, and killed many of these Philistines as enemy. In Judges 15, 16, we read that he took a, a jawbone of an axe 
And with that jawbone, he killed a thousand of his enemies at one time. So here we can see somebody that had supernatural strength, supernatural capability, empowered by the Holy Ghost. A man that was unusual in every respect. We haven't seen another like him. But he was definitely not the pin-up prophet that we might think we read about or see about in the book of Samuel. The Bible tells us that he broke his vows. He married outside his own tribe. He did this two times. This is not a good thing. And when we read his lifestyle, the historical account gives us a picture of somebody that's more like a vigilante than what it is. Somebody that was a, a, a man of God or a minister of the life-giving gospel of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us in our text that he goes to a prostitute in Gaza. And when he goes there, this enemy come to take him and he grasps hold of the doorposts. He takes hold of all of the accoutrements that, that are the door that are there at the gates of this city, reaches them out, he puts them on his shoulder, he carries them up and he dumps them there, facing Hebron, no doubt, so that the people there could look back and see what he had accomplished, or perhaps he could boast about that. Our own pastor, Pastor Payne, at the Men's Discipleship on Monday night, spoke about that rhetorical question, why would God use such flawed men? And, of course, the response that he gave was because that's the only type there is. And so when we look at Samson, we can't judge him too harshly because all men have feet of clay. And the tragedy is, is that many of these people with these great giftings often overlook the reality that they are a, a, a humble person and that they need to keep these things in check. Samson was certainly one of them. He let his testimony slide. We can see this carefully. The Bible tells us that one of Samson's major problems, and this is where we can see him letting his, his personal testimony begin to, he, he let that go loose, was because of the vow that he was under. This vow specifically tells us in Numbers chapter 6, verses 3 to 7, that he was not to touch any dead body, not to touch anything unclean. It was also, secondly, saying that he was never to cut his hair because he was under that vow, under this Nazarite vow. It was also to go and have nothing to do with any product of the vine, particularly no alcoholic drinks. And what we can see is that this man broke all three of these vows. That at this wedding feast that he went to, he goes along munching a honeycomb and he had taken this out of the carcass of this lion that he killed in the way when he was visiting this one of his uh, young girlfriends over there amongst the Philistines. We can read about this in chapter 14, verse 9. Then the Bible tell, uh, tells us that he has a feast with his second wife. And at this place, of course, there's wine and no doubt there's other alcoholic drinks, as many of the scholars remind us or they speak about us at this, at this particular feast. And then we see that his wife cuts his hair. And from this is linked to the secret of his great strength. Well, it's not because he had hair, but because he had made a vow to the living God that he would live a lifestyle in accordance with the calling that God had given to him. So the Bible tells us here that this man who would let his testimony slide, that had allowed these vows to be broken, is that we're dealing with the covenant-keeping God, the God that insists that people do keep their vows and insists and holds people to the vows that they make. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 4 tells us what God thinks about this. He says, When thou vowest a vow to God, defer not to pay it, for he has no pleasure in fools. And we can read on in verse 5 as well. So we can see this man was a big, tough, macho he-man, but he had a problem with the ladies. He had a she problem. Let's think about this mean mother that he settled himself with. The Bible tells us that when the Philistines got wind of the idea that Samson had his eye on this young lady, Delilah, that they came to her and they offered her a whole pack of money. They had this mean mumble working in there in the background of Samson's life. He thought that he was invulnerable. He thought, well, it doesn't matter how I live. 
but providing that I'm operating under this vow or because of whatever I've had or because of whatever God has done in the past, he's bound to continue on in the future. But that's a grave mistake. God is under no obligation to continue anything. But what we do see here is that the Bible tells us that these Philistines bribed Delilah and she began to work against him to try and find and wheedle out of him this secret of the great strength that God had given him under the power of the Holy Ghost. And the interesting thing here is that it doesn't matter who it is. There is always somebody that's working against us. And we have somebody is the enemy of our souls, the adversary, the Bible tells us. And he's there working carefully and with strategy and lying in wait as an adversary who is laying in ambush for you and I. And so that's a sobering thought. And we can see that working out in the life of this great and powerful man, Samson. So as we seek to honour God with our lifestyle and with how we live and with the decisions that we make and with our obedience to Him, we have to realise that these will be challenged at various stages. Jesus says in chapter 15 and verse 20 of the book of John, that a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. Jesus also said that in this world you will have tribulation. But take heart, because I have overcome the world. You can read that in John chapter 16, verse 33. So, in the midst of all of these things that we can see, we've got this woman, she's working against him, and she's persistent. Three times she works against him. Three times that she fails. Three times she asks him, Samson, what's the, the secret of your great strength? The first time the Bible says that Samson said, oh, okay, if you get these bowstrings, seven bowstrings that have never been used, you tie them up, you tie me up in these things there. This is the secret of my strength. And of course it fails. And in verse 10 of Judges chapter 16, Delilah calls out to Samson, look, you've mocked me and told me that This is the secret of your strength. This is nothing but lies that you've said to me. Now, please tell me what you may be bound with. She badges him, pesters him day and night. The Bible tells us that he tries telling her, well, if he can get these seven new ropes and that doesn't work. And then he says, you can tie my hair up into a loom and that, of course, doesn't work. Every time she's calling out, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. Samson leaps up and the Bible tells us that he shakes himself and the, the, the Philistines disappear like the cockroaches in the night that they are. But what, we're, what we can see here is we see a picture of some dumb ox that, you know, I mean, can't he get the picture? Hasn't he read the memo? This chick's out to get him. Three times that she does this, and the Bible tells us as she's there whining and moaning to him about where the secret of his great strength is, that eventually he gives in. Verse 16, daily she's pestering him. And eventually he caves in, and he tells her because his soul is vexed to death. The text says to us. So this is the tragedy of this man. He tells her this secret. She realizes he's told her the truth. And she calls the Philistines in. They shave his head. They cut all his hair off. He's there. They call out to him. He rises up. And in the pathos of the moment, the Bible says, I will go out before as at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. What a tragedy that is. He doesn't even understand that the Holy Spirit has left him. He doesn't even understand that what he had relied on so greatly before and treated with such, in such a light manner has disappeared. That's the tragedy of life. Great men fallen from great distances because they simply allowed the testimony, they allowed their lifestyle to be broken and to be shattered in that terrible way. Let's think about the gifts and calling of God. We can, we, we can see this man is fallen. That's, thankfully, that's not the end of it. The Philistines take him, the Bible tells us, they hook him up to where they get the donkeys to grind the grain. He's circulating around this mill wheel instead of a donkey. We've got this donkey Samson plodding one foot after another that's there. But the Bible tells us over a period of time, a change begins to happen. 
and that is that Samson's hair begins to grow. Now, I think this is indicative of something that's taking place in his heart. That over this period of time, this man's had the opportunity to sit there and reflect, if not sit there as he's plodding around, to plod around and reflect on how he's lived his life, the conduct of what he's done, what he had achieved before and what it was that God had expected from him in this great testimony that he had, in this great gifting that he had been given by the Holy Spirit. Bible tells us that in the gifting and calling of God, that God doesn't change his mind. Is that we have men and women change their minds, but the Holy Spirit doesn't change his mind. The Bible tells us in the book of Romans, chapter 11, verse 29, that the gifts and calling of God are without repentance, that they are irrevocable, is what the, what the New King James says. Just because Samson gave up on God does not mean that God was going to give up on Samson. Thank God for that. Because that same rule applies for each one of us. We may fail God, and we may turn our back on God, hopefully not too many of us. Hopefully we come to our senses, because the glorious and great news is, is that God doesn't give up on us, and God does not turn his back on us. See, in reality, repentance, the R word, that's the greatest gift of all, in many ways. That's the gift that we have, certainly at least in, in the in the top half dozen gifts that the Holy Spirit gives to us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9, it says, Now I rejoice, and not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance, for you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. So here we can see the difference. Just sorrow, that leads to death. That's not worth anything. But repentance, where a person says, God, I have made a huge mistake here. That I've been given something and I've treated it with contempt. I've treated it unrighteously and unworthily of the gift and the great gift that you have given me. God, this is a tragedy in my life. What is it that can be done? Can you forgive me in this? And will you do that? And the Bible tells us these are the words that God is looking to hear in a person's heart and from a person's mouth. In the book of Judges, chapter 16, verse 22, the Bible says, However, the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaven. Yes, it may take time. And a broken testimony will take time to recover. A person once asked Charles Spurgeon, the great pastor of the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London of a number of years ago, they, they asked him about a, a pastor who had fallen into immorality or who had allowed his testimony to be so shattered by that. They said, is it possible for this man ever to come back into the ministry again? And Spurgeon's response, I think, was very telling. He says, yes, he can, when his repentance is as notorious as his sin. And I think that gives us an understanding or, or, or some kind of an insight into what it means. When our testimony has been broken or shattered, there is hope for us. And there's hope in repentance. And there's hope in the healing power of the Holy Spirit who over time will take a person and allow them to rebuild that testimony that they had perhaps at one time. The Bible tells us that the Philistines play Samson at the pillar of this great building where they're having a feast. All the great lords of the Philistines, all the big shots were there, all the, the, the beautiful women were there that dressed up in their regalia. About 3,000 of them, we're told, they're in this, in this large auditorium. And they bring Samson out to come out as a spectacle so people can laugh at him. And so they bring him into the middle of the building and they set him near the pillars of the building. Well, here's Samson. He's had his eyes gouged out. He can't see. But he says to the boy that's leading him in there, place my hands upon the pillars of this building. And the boy does that. And as Samson does, he stretches his hands out and he calls out to the living God. He says, God, avenge me of the loss of sight of my eyes. This once, empower me again. And the Bible tells us with this, this massive strength is,
is that he forced apart these pillars and this building came tumbling down. And the impact of this man's life at the end was greater than the impact of the life that he led that led up to that date. And so we don't glory in death, we don't glory in destruction. What we do glory in is the purposes of God and a person who fulfills the purposes of God. Thank God that when God calls somebody and when God brings a gifting upon somebody's life, that gifting is, is irrevocable. God doesn't take that back. When God calls a person, God doesn't want to let that person go. And if a, if a person at whatever place in life and whatever stage in life will turn their heart back to the living God and say, Jesus Christ, please forgive me because I'm a sinner, the Bible tells us, the Holy Spirit will receive that person, will take them out of the kingdom of darkness and translate that person and put them into the kingdom of God's glorious light, into the membership of the kingdom of God's Son as one of His brothers and sisters as a member of the bride of Jesus Christ. Right now, you might be in a situation where you have failed God. We want to give you an opportunity right now to repent, to, to bring your life back to the, to the altar that God has called us to. Right now, if the Holy Spirit is speaking with you, You can ask Jesus Christ to forgive your sins and to rebuild your life. You may never have prayed a prayer. You may have never invited Jesus Christ into your heart before. This applies exactly the same to you. If you've never asked Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Saviour, you can do this right now. Whether your life has failed without knowing Jesus Christ or whether you have known him and you have turned your back or you have failed him, right now we can pray and we can ask Jesus Christ and we can receive him into our heart as our Lord and Saviour asks forgiveness for our sins. Why don't you pray with me tonight? Let's bow our heads together. Repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I know that I am a sinner. I know that Jesus Christ died for my sins. Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins, that I may know you, and that I may know I have a place and a home in heaven. I know you rose from the dead for me. I know you died on the cross for me. Jesus, save my life. With your blood, forgive me of all my sins. Jesus, thank you for saving me. Amen. If you prayed that prayer with me tonight and you meant it, Jesus Christ is going to make himself real to you right now. I want to thank you. This is the Potter's House Christian Fellowship. We urge you to take part in a local assembly, to join that assembly and to become part of the members of the body of Jesus Christ. Thank you tonight.